and welcome to Talking Politics. Now, this program is aimed at highlighting the work done by MPs and officials in their constituencies and in various communities around the nation. We'd also be looking at the effect of such work on the public. And today with me in our studios is the MP for East Ham and the Shadow Minister for Employment, the Right Honourable Stephen Teams. So you're very welcome to our studios. Thank you, Wilma. I'm very pleased to be here. Very pleased, I think, to be the first person you interviewed in these magnificent new studios. So congratulations on that. Thank you. We're glad you like it. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Now, sir, looking at what you've done, how has it been so far being the Shadow Minister for Employment? Well, it's the role I've had almost since the last election, ever since Ed Miliband became leader of the Labour Party, appointed me Shadow Minister for Employment. And it's been a big job because I've been shadowing what the government has been doing on employment and on benefits and welfare, where there have been a lot of changes. And it's been my task to come up with better ideas than the government's about what we should be doing. But it's a role that I'm very committed to because I've felt very strongly for a long time that what's really important in an area like ours in East End of, of London is that people have the opportunity of work and too many people have not had the opportunity of work in the past. When I first became a councillor in this area, which is over 30 years ago now, people started coming talk to me about their problems and it quickly dawned on me that the thing that really made a difference was when people who were out of work were able to get into work and their lives were changed as a result. So I've been very committed to this particular role in our shadow team. And what I'd really love is to be the Minister for Employment, the proper Minister for Employment, after the election, if we're successful um, in being elected on the 7th of May. Well, we look forward to the 7th of May and see how it turns out to be. And being the Minister of Employment, let's look at some figures here. At the end of 2009, unemployment was 2.5 million when your party was in office. In 2011, it peaked to 2.7 million, and it is now down to 1.86 million. What are your plans to bring this figure down further? Well, you're absolutely right. Unemployment has fallen significantly, um, particularly over the last year or so. It didn't fall very much after the general election in 2010. In fact, as the all figures show, it, it went up for a while, uh, having already been high because, of course, we've been through the global economic crisis by 2010. But what I think is important is to look a little bit further into those headline figures. And one of the things that's most troubling for me, well, there are two things, but one in particular is that youth unemployment in recent months has not been going down. In fact, it's been going up at a time when overall unemployment has been falling. The number of unemployed young people has been rising. And that's very troubling. I think it's a real worry that so many young people have not been able to get a, a proper start in employment. And many of them have been out of work for quite a long time, have never really got the chance of a, of a proper job. So we're absolutely determined, if we're successful at the election, to tackle that. The other thing which is very striking is because we had a long period when unemployment was high, there's now a very large number of people who've been out of work for a long, ter a long time. So long-term unemployment is, is high. And it's those two things, youth unemployment and long-term unemployment, that we really want to address if we're elected on the 7th of May. Okay, you have pledged a compulsory jobs guarantee scheme for the young unemployed for six months, paid for by a tax on bankers' bonuses. Now, we have families that have not worked for three generations. Is a paid job the first step? Well, it's a very important step. Uh, and often there will have to be other preparation first. But for young people, I think it is the right, undoubtedly the right first step. And in fact, the, the last government, the, the Labour government before 2010, did have a programme like this in place. It was called the Future Jobs Fund, and it really did a very good job. And I've met a lot of young people since then who were on the Future Jobs Fund who said to me that was the one thing that gave me a chance, because it's a proper job with a real employer. It's not a scheme. It's not a training program. It's a job with a proper wage paid at least at the level of the national minimum wage, a proper contract of employment and so on. And that, I think, is the break that so many young people need. And once they've had that break, they're away. They can sort themselves out from then on. But it's that first chance 
that too many young people are missing out on at the moment and we want to make sure they get a chance. Now, taking on the bankers' bonuses, when did you do well, shouldn't they be rewarded? Well, uh, bankers are being very fully rewarded, uh, including with these very large bonuses, and I think they're in, even higher this year than they were last year. And we've said that it's only fair, in our view, that people doing extremely well with very large amounts of money coming in should make a bigger contribution to enable young people who haven't had the chance of a job at all to get into work. And, and that's why we're applying this banker's bonus tax once more. It's happened once before. Alistair Darling, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, introduced a, a, a tax of that kind before the last election. That was what paid for the future jobs fund for young people before 2010. We want to repeat that uh, uh, levy again and use the proceeds in the same way. And let's look at some of the work you've done in the community. You've organised job fairs at West Ham United ground, attended by several hundred local people. Now, have there been any spin-off from these fairs? Well, uh, I think there have been some very good connections made for local people uh, in terms of getting jobs. Um, we've done it three times now altogether, and each one has been bigger than the last. So they've been very, very popular. And what they've shown to me is just how much local people who are not in work are anxious to get a job. Sometimes the impression is given that people don't really want a job. Well, that's not my experience. I think people who are not in work are really very, very keen to get a job. And these fairs have given them some help. We have, we've tried, we haven't actually been able to work out exactly how many people have got a job coming out of the fair, because it's quite difficult to keep track on things. I mean, sometimes people might get a job arising from a conversation they had a couple of months earlier at a jobs fair. So we don't have figures on just how many people have, have got jobs. But the response to them has been very positive, both from people looking for work and also for the employers advertising jobs at the fairs as well. Let's go back to when you started in 1988, when you campaigned for an international station at Stratford. And this paved the way for the Olympics in London in 2012. Now, what are the plans do you have for the Borough of East Ham and for communities nationwide if you become the future Minister for Employment? Well, at the centrepiece of our employment policy is the job guarantee that you were just talking to me about. There are some other changes we want to make. We want to change the way the job centres work. We want to um, commission employment support on a more local basis. At the moment, it's done on a very big regional basis, and I think that's one of the reasons it doesn't work very well. We, we want it to be, to be done more, more locally. And that's a, a big programme for employment uh, in government. But there are some very positive plans for this part of London, the east end of London, where I'm an MP, as you say, in 1988, I was the chair of Newham Council's planning committee and I started the campaign to bring the International Passenger Station to Stratford on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Didn't look very promising at the time, but we eventually succeeded with that campaign and uh, it took over 10 years before the government agreed that the railway line, which we now call High Speed One, should come through Stratford on the way to St Pancras and there would be a station at Stratford and that led to the possibility of an Olympic bid for the rail lands, Stratford rail lands, where the Olympic Stadium now, now stands. And I think, you know, we are seeing a lot of uh, further development on the Olympic Park following the success of the Games in, in 2012. And I think in this part of London, we can be quite optimistic about the future because of the things that are going on there. University College London is opening up a campus on the Olympic Park. Victoria and Albert Museum is set, setting up there. There are major employers. BT Sport has got its studio on the Olympic Park. Other enterprises coming along. The Financial Conduct Authority, the main financial regulator, is having a, an office, its headquarters, built on the Olympic Park. And then uh, alongside that, there are other projects going forward elsewhere, like, for example, the Asian Business Port Initiative, which is just... Um, uh, really a few hundred yards from where we are at the Love World studio, um, opposite London City Airport in the Royal Docks. Uh, that's aimed at Chinese banks and other businesses who want to set up offices in Europe, and London is a great place for them to come. And they uh, reckon that they will create 20,000 jobs 
in this part of London once that project, that development is fully completed. So I think we can be optimistic about the prospects for, for this part of, of London particularly, but I'm, as you say, interested in what we can do across the country and I hope that the reform plans that we're bringing forward will be seen by people as the right way forward for employment across the UK. Do you want to give us any of your plans for the country? Well, the, the, the job guarantee, number one, um, the, uh, the, this new way of commissioning employment support. At the moment, the government has a thing called the work programme. There have been some good things about that, but on the whole, it's been disappointing. And I think one of the reasons is that they've just let very big regional contracts we want to see more localised uh, contracts, just a group of local authorities in an area working together, commissioning an employment support project with the Department for Work and Pensions, which can really help people in that local area to access the employment opportunities that are available in that locality. The government's programme has been particularly disappointing for people out of work on health grounds, for people on employment and support allowance and I believe we can do a much better job for them as well. And then the network of job centres will continue to be very important, as they always have been in the past, but we are worried that there's been too much of a focus in the job centres on punishing people, taking their benefit away from them. And there's been a lot of pressure put on job centre advisors to focus on sanctioning people, taking their benefits away. We think the focus should instead be on helping people getting people who are out of work back into work and I'm confident we can do a much better job. Now, do you think if you keep people on benefits, if you leave people to be on benefits for very long, don't you think that deters them from getting any work? I do. I think that's exactly the problem. And that's why our job guarantee will kick in for over 25s after two years of unemployment. So if you're still out of work claiming job seekers allowance after two years, we will say here's the guarantee of an offer of a job and hopefully a, a choice of two or three jobs. And it's up to you to choose the one that you want, but you will need to take one of them. Uh, we don't want people staying on job seekers allowance for years and years and years. What people want is to be in work. We think they should have that opportunity. And once the opportunity has been offered, then we'll expect people to take it up. Well, viewers, this is Talking Politics, and this program is aimed at highlighting the work MPs and officials have done in their various constituencies and communities, and also the effect of this work on the public and their future plans for the nation. If you've got any questions, you can send emails to talkingpolitics at loveworldtv.co.uk. We'll be taking a break now, and we'll be right back. The book, The Rhapsody of Realities, is, is so important. It helps you very quickly to begin to understand the Word of God. Take that material and start reading it. Our job is to distribute 100 million copies of Rhapsody around the world. We set our target to have over 500 translations of Rhapsody. Remember Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom is published throughout the world, the end will come. So we're actually helping to speed up the coming of Christ. We're right involved, we're, we're in the midst of his agenda. We're working in sync with him to bring the king back. And we have to be as passionate as we could ever be through the power of the Spirit of God to get the job done. So keep your fire on. Welcome back. This is Talking Politics, and we've been interviewing the MP for East Ham and the Shadow Minister for Employment, the Right Honourable Stephen Tees. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you, Wilma. Now, you are the Labour Party's envoy and chair of Christians on the left. And in your own words, I quote, you said, the early Labour Party had deep roots in the church and the influence of faith remains with us today. Now, tell us some of this influence. Well, looking at the history, it's very clear. The great majority of, for example, the first Labour MPs who were elected in the early part of the 20th century were very committed Christians, people who'd 
been active in their, their chapels, worshipping alongside other working people, perhaps in the mines, in the factories, wherever it had, had been. And they were the people who founded the Labour Party and gave it its, its start. Uh, I chair the organisation, as you say, Christians on the Left, which is affiliated to the Labour Party. It's an organisation of Labour Party members and supporters who are Christians and for whom faith in Christ is the starting point for their politics. And we have representatives uh, at the Labour Conference, Labour Party Conference every year. We work to point out to the party the importance and the value of what the churches are doing around the UK and also to encourage people in the churches to support the Labour Party. Ed Miliband as leader, he's not a person of faith, he's not a member of our organisation, but he's been very supportive to our organisation. I think he looks around Britain and sees what a big part today the churches are playing, what a positive part the churches are playing, and recognises that our party wants to get behind churches that are making such a big and positive impact in their communities. What plan does Ed Miliband have for religious freedom? Well, we've announced, Ed has announced, and Douglas Alexander, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, has spelt this out, that if we're elected, uh, Ed, as Prime Minister, would appoint uh, an envoy for religious freedom who reported directly to Ed Miliband as Prime Minister and whose task it would be, on behalf of the British government, to lobby for religious freedom around the world and to take action when religious freedom is at threat. And we receive a lot of reports these days about Christians being persecuted around the world. Persecution is affecting more Christians than members of any other faith group around the world at the moment. And it would be the job of this envoy to press for that persecution to end and to work for Christians and people of other faiths around the world to be able to worship freely. As the chair of Christians on the left, you're a Christian and you're in politics. Now, what role do Christians have in politics? Well, I think it's a very big role. Uh, of course, people often say you shouldn't mix up faith and politics. And if you do, you're asking for trouble. And they point to trouble somewhere in the world and say, there you are, that's what goes wrong if religion and politics get mixed up. But I think they're mistaken. Uh, I take a very different view. I think the truth is that faith is a very good starting point for politics because faith, faith in Christ is the source of exactly the values that we need to make politics work. Values like responsibility, solidarity, patience, persistence, compassion, truthfulness. Those are the values that can make politics successful. We need more of them. And I'd like to see more people whose starting point is belief in Jesus stepping forward, being willing to take on political responsibility and to work with others to change our communities and our country and our world for the better. And some of the changes you've actually done was helping to ensure that Premier Christian Radio hasn't been kicked off the national digital radio spectrum. Yes, that's just happened very recently. The uh, organisation that runs the digital radio multiplex, Digital One as it's called, indicated that it didn't want Premier Christian Radio on there anymore. Instead, it wanted yet another pop music station. Most of the stations on there are already pop music stations. I couldn't see any justification for kicking Premier off to make way for yet another pop music station. So I called for and secured what we call an adjournment debate in the House of Commons where I made the case for Premier Christian Radio to stay on national digital radio. I was very pleased to receive support in that debate from other MPs. And then the minister, in responding to the debate, agreed with the argument that I had made. And I'm very pleased that since that debate, Premier has been able to reach an agreement with Digital One and its place on national digital radio looks now to be secure. But, you know, the, that's an example of the kind of thing that we do need to be vigilant about to make sure that Christians and others can play a full part in national broadcasting, as I think it's very important that they should. Let's go to education now. Do you have, or does your party have, any alternative plans for tuition fees? 
Yes, we think tuition fees are too high at the moment with the maximum level of £9,000. Um, and Ed Miliband has therefore announced that if Labour is elected on the 7th of May, we will reduce the maximum fee for higher education uh, from £9,000, reduce it by one third down to £6,000. Now, obviously it would be better if we could reduce it further still, but I think that's a very important step and a very welcome step. And something that I've noticed how strongly young people feel about this, that they, they want to do higher education, of course, they want the opportunities that higher education presents to them quite rightly, and we want them to undertake higher education if they're able to, but the prospect of doing that and being saddled with a debt of, you know, best part of £30,000 is a pretty worrying prospect for many young people, so we are going to reduce it, reduce it by a third. Do you have any plans for bursaries? Well, there are already some bursary arrangements in place. We will encourage those. Uh, some universities have their own arrangements. And of course, there are arrangements that some companies are willing to offer as well, where they will meet the costs of students in higher education uh, with a, a job with the employer at the end. And we will certainly continue to encourage arrangements of that kind. Let's look at young people in politics. Uh, you organised for Newham Borough, the Borough of Newham, young people last summer and one in February to give young people an insight into politics. And you are dealing with teenagers, basically. Now, why starting so early? Well, we set up these politics schools. As you say, I've done them twice. They've been aimed at 16 and 17-year-olds living in, in Newham. And what I've found is that a lot of young people are really interested in politics, really interested in the big questions about where our society is going to be going over the next 10, 20, 30 years. They're not very impressed by party politics, to be honest. I think they've uh, seen things and read things which do not impress them about the way party politics seems to function. So what I've wanted to do is bring them into Parliament so they can see for themselves, meet the people who are involved in politics, meet the people who are involved with the media, get a first-hand view of what it's like when you're working to change things for the better in your country. And what I've found for the groups who've been so far is tremendous enthusiasm. I think there's enormous potential amongst our young people, young people growing up in churches in, in uh, this area at the moment, other young people as, as well, very committed to making things better in the future. And what I want is for them to see that they can make a, a, an impact in politics, to get beyond some of the things they read, some of the things that they, they hear, which give them the impression that politics isn't for them, just show them the reality and encourage them to think this is something that I could do to make a real positive impact in the future. Now, why should people vote Labour? What will a Labour government do that a Conservative government hasn't done? I think the central argument that we'll be making in this election campaign is the Conservative Party view has been that if they look after a few people at the top, everything else will be fine. We're saying Britain isn't going to succeed unless it's run in the interests of the many, not for a few. So ordinary people in Britain over the last few years have had a pretty hard time dealing with a, a cost of living crisis. We've seen real wages falling over the last five years, prices going up, energy bills went rocketing at one stage, food went up, and people have struggled. And the current government really hasn't recognised that or done anything to help. Labour in government will start from the point of view of the interests of those ordinary people who've had a hard time over the last few years, who want to do well, who want to do well by their children, and a Labour government will be on their side, not just on the side of a, a few well-off people at the top. So one more word for people out there who are thinking, well, should I vote Stephen Timms? Well, I, I hope that people will. And uh, for my constituents uh, in East Ham, I'm making a case based on my record as an MP over the last 21 years. I aim to be a very accessible MP 
to make it easier for people to come and find me and see me when they need to. According to the BBC, I do more constituency surgeries than any MP in London because I want to be available to my constituents. I hope that many people in the area have had a good experience when they've approached me and that I've been able to uh, help with their problems. So on, on, on that front, I, I want to make a, a, a case for myself to be re-elected, but I also want to set out Labour's vision for the future, a country which is run in the interests of the many, where young people can look forward to a, a better future and where all of us can feel confident that we're going to share in the economic well-being of, of Britain. Those are the changes that a Labour government will want to make. Thank you very much, Stephen you, James. Mama. Well, viewers, this programme is called Talking Politics. Here we aim at highlighting the work MPs and officials have done at their boroughs and in their constituents, and also in the community, the effect of this work on the public and the future plans for the nation. If you've got any questions at all, you can send emails to talkingpolitics at lovelltv.co.uk. We've just interviewed the MP for East Ham and the Shadow Minister for Employment, the Right Honourable Stephen Teams. Thank you very much for coming to our studios and we look forward to seeing you next Thank time. Thank you for having me, Wilmia. I'd be very keen to come back. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of our programmes.